Hey, thank you guys so much for giving me this opportunity to be here today. Um, uh, I know the last time I was asked to teach in the Rooted study, uh, it snowed, and so we had to pre-record that, and now it's pouring down rain, so I don't think Libby's ever going to ask me to teach again. But it's an honor to be here with you guys, and you know, I know some of you, and, and, and not all of you, and some of you know me, but not everything, but so I wanted to kind of give you a little background of, of, of who I am and what I've, I've been doing, and um, I've been in full-time ministry for 27 years, and started out in worship ministry, and then somewhere along the line, God called me out of that, and so for 10 or 12 years, I um, was a senior pastor, and uh, I was able to teach and preach on a weekly basis, and um, I still get nervous doing that, but about three years ago, praise God, he called me out of that, and, and now I'm into worship ministry. I'm the worship pastor here at Northside, as Libby said, so uh, it's a joy, and, and just if you don't know about my family, I'm been married to Sally for 27 years. We've got four kids, and Luke is uh, in the Air Force. Uh, Grace, she is a, a sergeant. Uh, she's a, in a corrections facility, and that still blows my mind because to think that my little daughter who once wanted dresses and dolls for Christmas now asks for combat boots and tactical gear, and it's just crazy to think that. But then uh, Mariah, she's 14, and, and then about five years ago, my wife and I, we adopted, our family adopted a little girl from China. Her name's Lottie, and so uh, that's kind of my family in a nutshell. But um, today we're going to be studying in um, John chapter 7. I'm only going to be looking at uh, two or three verses, so we're not going to unpack the whole chapter, but I'll try to give you as much context as possible. So I'm going to do something that is a little different we haven't done maybe before, but if you have your Bible um, or a copy of the scriptures on a phone or tablet, turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 7, starting in verse 37, and I would ask that you would stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. So uh, let's dive into the Word, and this is what it says. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who had believed in him were to receive, for as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Let's pray. God, I just come to you today, and, and Lord, we thank you for the rain. We thank you for... Um, how you are quenching our land's thirst. And, and today, God, as we look to this scripture, we pray that you would quench um, our thirst today in, in your son, Jesus. God, I have nothing uh, to give today other than just pointing people to you, and that's my heart's desire. So, Father, speak today, speak to our hearts, speak to people today who are in this room and watching online. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So, in the text... It's a, it's a water metaphor. It's a metaphor uh, of water in the text. And it's not the first time Jesus has used this metaphor. If you remember back a few weeks ago, you were studying in John chapter 4, uh, Jesus encounters the Samaritan woman. And if you know anything from that story, the Samaritan woman, her soul was dry. Her, her heart was hardened she thirsted. She had a real thirst and a real need for real love in her life. And Jesus tells us in John chapter 4 that she was married five times. He brings that confession to her. And, and when Jesus met her, she was in relationship number six. Not married, still seeking, still searching for love. She couldn't find anything uh, in this world she couldn't find anything in someone else to quench her thirst. And she had a real thirst, and Jesus knew it. And Jesus said to her in John chapter 4, go back to John chapter 4, verse 10, and he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus said to this to her because he knew the woman ached for something. She thirsted for more. And now in, in, in John chapter 6, that was probably last week what you guys were studying, the crowd is getting ready to leave, and Jesus hints at this metaphor again and says, whoever believes in me will never thirst. 
So if you take those words to, to believe, it means to never thirst again. So if you believe in Christ, you'll never thirst again. So here we have in chapter 7, this word thirst again. Why? Why is this word here again in chapter 7? Again, it's a metaphor, but now let's look at the context of all that's going on in John chapter 7. Okay? The context is this. This is the great day of celebration. It's almost over, so we're at the end of it, but it's the great day of celebration. It's the last day of the great day of the feast. They've been celebrating God's provision. The Feast of Tabernacles, where, where God provided for them in the wilderness. And so they were celebrating what happened years and years ago. And on this last day, we see the whole crowd is there for the great day of the feast. And this is what would happen. The religious leaders would, would gather together. They would march in procession. The crowd would gather with them, and they would follow. And then they would, the religious leaders would pour out water in remembrance of all that God had done. So that's the backdrop of what we see in this text. And Jesus sees all this that's going on. And the scripture says he cries out. Now he's not crying. He's not in tears. He's pleading with them. Okay, this is a side of Jesus that we don't often like to think of. We like to think of cuddly Jesus or, you know, sweet baby Jesus. But this is Jesus pleading with the people, crying out to them, yelling at the top of his lungs saying, don't go over there. That's not going to quench your thirst. He's saying, come to me. Come to me and drink. If you're thirsty, this is where you need to be, right here. Again, there's so much emphasis on this word thirst. And as I was looking at this text, I was like, why? Why is he putting so much emphasis on this word thirst? Then I was in my office last week, and as I was studying this passage, God reminded me over the last 27 years of ministry, I've seen why Jesus put so much emphasis on the word thirst in this text. In that 12-year period of me being a senior pastor, many times I would be called upon to go to a hospital visit and meet people. And I don't like hospitals. I, my dad was in the hospital a lot as a kid, and so hospitals just weird me out. Tubes and, and needles and bleh, not, not me. Don't like it. And so as a senior pastor, if people would say, hey, can you go visit? I'd always say, look, if I'm coming to visit you in the hospital, most likely you're dying because I don't do hospital visits. I know that sounds terrible. I'm sorry, but... I remember on one occasion, one of our church members at the church I was a part of, Shady Oaks Baptist, I was the senior pastor, and one of my good friends said, hey, Brad, would you go visit my dad in the hospital? He's dying. He's not a church member. He's never been to, maybe been to church once or twice. He was a priester, Christmas and Easter, you know, and um, I don't think he knows the Lord. So at that moment, I go into like, pastor mode. This is not the time to go into the hospital and go, you know, hello, I'm Brad. I just want to pray with you and make, no, no. I went in there because this is what he told me to do. He said, go in there and bring the heat. I said, okay. So I brought my Bible and I went up to Mr. Williams, what was his name? And he was a frail of a man. I mean, he was like a shell. He, he had tubes in him. And like I said, it weirds me out. He had tubes and he could barely breathe. And he, he was skinny and free. I mean, you could just see the bones in his chest. His, it was just, it was, you knew he was dying. He was pasty. And I went by his bed and I said, Mr. Williams, your son asked me to come and speak to you today. I told him who I was. I said, your son asked me to come speak to you today because you're probably not going to live. I said, uh, I brought my Bible and I want to read you some scripture. The Bible says right here that the wages of sin is, is death. And, and Mr. Williams, I want you to know that that's what your life has earned you. Death. It's not just a physical dying. Because apart from God, when, when you breathe your last breath here on earth, you've got some spiritual dying to do, Mr. Williams. And if you don't make that right, you're going to hell. I look back at the sun and he goes... I said, do you believe that, Mr. Williams? He couldn't talk, but he goes, yeah. He just shook his head, yeah. 
I said, but that's not all the Bible says, Mr. Williams. The Bible says that, that uh, yes, that we all deserve to die and we're going to go to hell. But the Bible also says that the free gift, there's a free gift. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. So do you believe that, Mr. Williams? He shook his head, yeah. The Bible also says, Mr. Williams, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the grave, you can be saved right now. Do you believe that, Mr. Williams? He said, yeah, and he starts crying. And I'm a crier, so I'm crying too. But Mr. Williams started crying. I said, Mr. Williams, I got a couple questions for you. I said, are you sorry for your sin? He said, yeah. I said, Mr. Williams, do you repent of your sin? and do you, do you want to turn away from your sin and trust Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for your sins to take all that sin, sin away? Do you believe that? And he, he, he shook his head, yes. I said, Mr. Williams, do you believe that Jesus is your Savior and your Lord? He said, yes. And I prayed with him right there, right there in that hospital room, right by his hospital bed. Where he was struggling to breathe. And right then and there, Mr. Williams asked Jesus to quench his thirst. Now, you might say, well, you just scared him. You you scared him. Yeah, I did. I wanted to scare him of hell. I wanted him to be scared of hell because if he didn't, Get right with God. He was going to spend eternity in hell. So yes, that's what I did. He needed to be scared of hell. The wrath of God is something that we need to be afraid of. It's not something that we need to toy with. But isn't it beautiful to see the mercy and grace of God when it is extended to even the worst of sinners? Isn't that a beautiful picture? See, look, our bodies, when, we, when God created us, our bodies, we were made to live on water. If you try to go a month without water, you're going to die. You can't do it. Just like our bodies were made to live on water, our souls were made to live on God. We need the living water in our souls just like we need the physical water in our bodies to live. We've seen that in our, our land Over the past summer, there was no rain. There was no water. Everything was dead. It was barren. It was dormant. And now, praise God, we've got rain. And now things can come to life. And that's why Jesus is using this metaphor. If your body goes without water, you will die. If your soul goes without God, you'll die. That's why Jesus is crying out to the people because he knows this. He says, come to me and drink. Don't go over there and look for these other things that might satisfy you because they, they, they're not going to satisfy you. They're not eternal. Only Jesus can satisfy our thirsty souls. And that's why he's talking about in this passage. And so I want to just kind of take that passage. I want to break it apart just a little bit. I want to give us four conditions, okay? And this is going to be easy on how you can remember these four conditions. It's the who, the why, the how, and the what. Okay, very easy. Number one, who is the gospel offered to? That's the main question we need to ask ourselves is, who is the gospel offered to? Well, it tells us who it is offered to in verse 37, 38. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So he says right there, who's the gospel offered to? Anyone who thirsts. Who's the gospel, uh, the gospel offered to? Whoever believes in me. Remember, now, let's, let's try to put ourselves in John chapter uh, 7. Who is standing with Jesus right now? Think about that. Judas, he's the devil himself, you know. You know Judas' story. Peter. Peter, Peter's there. What does Peter do? Peter denies him three times, or Peter's going to deny him three times. All the scribes and Pharisees that hate Jesus, they're there. All of Jesus' enemies, they're, they're probably there. The ones that left Jesus in chapter 6, John chapter 6, 
They're probably there too. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of people are there. And Jesus offers himself to everyone. Not just one, but to all. And Jesus is offering himself to us today as well. Those who are hearing the truth of the gospel. And here's the truth of the gospel. God created you. And God loves you. And your sin has separated you from God. And if the Spirit is moving in you and you realize your thirst, that's what the Scripture says, anyone who thirsts and whoever believes in Christ, that's who the gospel's for and that's who can be saved. Right there. So the the who of the gospel is you, it's me, it's us, it's everyone that he created. So number two, write this down. Why is the gospel offered? Why? Why? Well, there it is. It's in verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. If anyone thirsts. That is the human condition right there. It's universal. It's worldwide. Everyone thirsts for something. We all ache and yearn for something. Sometimes we, we try to spend a lifetime trying to fill that void in our lives. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah. It's in the Old Testament. It's right after Isaiah and right before Lamentations. Jeremiah chapter 2. God spoke of this very thing in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, where he said, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. People thirst, and we seek to quench it with broken wells of foul water. One of the things we all long for, it's love. We all long for love. We all want to be loved. And instead of finding our soul satisfaction in Christ, we see this. Maybe you've seen it in your family, your friends. You definitely see it on TV. You see it on the media. You see it in our schools. You sometimes see it in our churches. But people drink from the broken cisterns of wrong relationships and broken sexuality. It's rampant in our world. We can try to deny it, but it's true. Sexuality, gender reality, marriages, relationships, they're all broken. Yeah, it's because we live in a broken, sin-filled world. I get that. But we continue to see pornography rise and escalate. Sex before marriage. Look, I can't tell you how many students and young adults I've talked to that they've come to me and say, well, I sat under a a biblical biblical teacher saying that, that sex before marriage, it's not bad. That's what's going into the minds of, 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 and I'm making myself old, but that's what's going in the minds of the young people today. Kids are experiencing gender dysphoria. If you don't know what that is, Google it. That'll make your head spin. Parents are allowing kids to decide what gender they want to be. Or... Our society is saying that it's okay to do that. And doctors are allowing it. And they're, I mean, I could go on and on. I, I mean, that could be a whole message in itself. But here's what we, we, we need to understand. That if this trend keeps going and if we keep allowing our, our world, our friends, our, our church, our, our community to look for other ways to quench their thirst, they're going to die. Trace the life of Jesus in the Gospels. From the woman at the well, to the rich young young ruler, to the religious Nicodemus, to the wealthy Zacchaeus, all the way to our thirst today. Everyone in all of society, in all of history, has been thirsty for something. And the scripture tells us that it is Christ and only Christ that can satisfy the craving of our soul to quench the thirst that we have. You've got to remember the simple 
truth. Our bodies were created to live on water, and our souls are created to live on the living water. And if you don't have Christ in this world, you will die in the next one. That's why Jesus is crying out to the people. He's yelling. He's, he's like at the, like the, the top of a mountain saying, don't go there, come here. The who of the gospel, it's, it's whoever thirsts, whoever believes. The why of the gospel is because everybody thirsts for something. That's why we, as Christ followers, we need to share the gospel. Don't just leave it up to the, the, the preachers and the teachers. That's what Pastor Van talked about last week, that it's not his job to do all the work. It's, it's his job. It's our job as ministers to build up the church, to equip the church to do the works of ministry. Part of that is evangelism, sharing the gospel. Number three, write this one down. How to appropriate the gospel. How do we appropriate the gospel? Again, verse 37, verse 38. We're not going to move away from these verses because there's so much meat in them. How do we make this offer of eternal life, of living water, how do we make it ours? Well, if you look at verse 37, the end of verse 37, that's the metaphor. The beginning of verse 38, that's the explanation. Look at what he says. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So to come and drink from Jesus means to believe on him. To believe in him. To come and drink means you believe. Verse 38 gives us the way we appropriate this gift. It is offered, but it is appropriated through your faith in Jesus Christ. Do you believe? That's how you make it ours. Do you believe what Christ is doing here? Jesus is demanding something that is very important for us to understand. He is calling us for an individual response. We all have to answer for ourselves one day with no excuses and no one else to blame. We can't blame the hypocritical Christian that you sat next to uh, one, one Sunday morning. You can't blame the, the Bible study leader that, that made you upset. You can't blame the person that took your parking place. You, can't, you, you, you just can't. Can you imagine... You standing before God on judgment day and God goes, why didn't you go to church and worship me with your family? Why why didn't you go to church and and study me in the scriptures? And and you go, well, I I tried it once, but, you know, that that person made me mad. And I'm I'm not going to go again. Can you imagine saying that to God? Can you imagine standing before him? Every excuse we could ever make for not coming to him and drinking from him and being quenched of our thirst, that's all going to fade away on that day. So the question is, I want you to answer, is what are you doing daily, personally, about the longing in your heart? Where do you go to to seek satisfaction for your soul? Do you drink from what Jeremiah said? Do you drink from the wells, the broken wells of this passing world? Or do you daily, do you daily, maybe hourly, come to the living water that is Jesus Christ and and, and seek him? Because that's what Jesus is saying right there. That's why he's crying out to us. Last one, this is the what. I'm almost done. What happens when when you believe the gospel? What, What happens when you believe the gospel? Verse 38 says it right there. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. From the inside of that person, something happens. When when Christ possesses a person, takes hold of their heart, there's something that can't be kept, and it, it, it gushes out. Someone this morning, I think it was you in the red hat, someone told me that, Coming in today, the, the, the gutters were overflowing because there's so much water and there's probably tons of leaves and debris in there and, and, and so the waters weren't flowing out of the, the gutter. They were just kind of gushing over the, the edge of the, the roof and, and it's a great picture that something got a hold of that gutter. Something kept it. 
And so the water is just spilling over. It's just spilling over. And, and when Christ grabs a hold of your heart, when Christ grabs a hold of your life, and you're experiencing his living water, and, and you're, 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 you're feasting on it, you're, you're, it's quenching you. It's, it's not making your soul dry, but it's making your soul alive. When that happens, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. That's what happens when you believe. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that when you see people, you're going to see them through the eyes of Christ. When, when you talk to people, you're going to overflow grace and, and mercy and love and forgiveness, and you're not going to hold grudges. Even people that are completely different from you and have different beliefs from you, you're still going to be a river of, of overflowing life giving water that comes from Christ. That's what happens when you believe. When you believe in Christ and he gets a hold of your soul and he, he fills you with his living water and you go through a trial in your life or you go through a tragedy in your family, somehow you're going to go through it with joy and with love and dignity and grace and people are going to look at you and go, how did you do that? And this is your opportunity to share the living water. To say, look, my life was dry, but I went to Jesus. And he quenched my thirst. That's how I can do what I do. It's not because of me. It's because of Christ. It's because of his living water flowing in me. And now I get to walk through whatever God lays before me. And I thirst on Jesus every day. And I drink from him every day. And he fills me up every day. And I'm overflowing every day. There, there is a reality, and I'm going to close with this. I don't know every one of you here today. I don't. I know some of you, but I don't know all of you, and I don't know where you are. And so for me to just walk away from this part would be detrimental. I'm not implying anything, but I do want to ask you, are you thirsty this morning? And I'm not talking about I need more coffee. I'm not talking about I just ate something and I got to, you know what? I'm talking about are you thirsty? Is there a spiritual thirst in your soul are you tired of drinking from the wells of nasty waters of this world that lead to death and destruction are you ready for your thirst to finally be quenched because if that's the case then maybe you need to do what Isaiah said he said come every one of you who is thirsty come to the water Come and find your satisfaction in Christ and Christ alone. He's the only one that can satisfy your thirst. He's the only one that can quench your heart's desire. Let me pray for us, and I'll let you guys go and you go into your study. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to um, first thank you for just giving me this opportunity, God, to dive just a little bit into your word as we continue to look at John chapter 7. I pray, God, that these verses don't leave us void, but they fill our hearts and lives with truth. And if you're here this morning with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if, or if you're watching online, if you are thirsty and God has spoken to your heart, if you've been trying to fill that void with anything and everything but Jesus, would you finally humble yourself, repent of that, and come to Jesus? You don't have to do it publicly. It can be privately between you and him. 
It's simply you just saying, Jesus, I am thirsty. Right there where you're praying, Jesus, I am thirsty. Jesus, I have a need in my life, and it needs to be met, and I know that only you can meet that need. If you're thirsty, just say, Jesus, I believe. I believe that you can quench what is going on in my life. I believe that when I come to you, you are going to fill my life, and it will overflow. And so, Jesus, I come to you, and I, I, I want to drink from you. I want to drink from your word. I want to sit at your feet so that I thirst no more. So, God, I pray that you would continue to bless and, and, and inspire and, and, and just give life to this study in the Gospel of John to these women. I pray, God, that you would take your word and let it just overwhelm us into a sense of awe of who you are and what you've done and what you're going to do as we continue to thirst and to drink from you. And I pray all these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.